be speaking about this topic of reinventing Buddhism. And it's a little bit of an absurd thing to say that we're going to reinvent Buddhism, but uh, and we're, we, we four are not going to reinvent Buddhism up here. <laughs> we're just going to talk about what, is it, what does it mean to think about innovating uh, in the modern world? What does it mean for a tradition which has been around for a long time to uh, change as the world changes around it? And what does it mean for us to change uh, as the world changes? And I'll just say a little bit about uh, the topic and then also about my my friends here. Um, so when I was thinking about Buddhism, I was thinking about how Buddhism's always been in some ways a, a kind of radical experimentation in terms of what works to alleviate human suffering and what works to explore the deep potentials of our human mind and heart, our human experience. So in that sense, it's always been about innovation, always been about trying things that work, uh, as um, the panelists from yesterday mentioned. Um, but today we're in the, a really interesting situation. We're in the 21st century. We're in a time period that's marked by extremely rapid change. Um, and those of us who are interested in responding to that change are often, most often just overwhelmed by how quickly everything's moving. Um, at least I can say that for myself. So we wanted to explore what does it mean to respond to change? And uh, especially as Buddhists, like we're always talking about change. What does it mean to actually change? So um, let me introduce uh, the people here joining me. Um, first on my left, we've got David Loy. Uh, David is a Buddhist philosopher. He's local here in Boulder. He just moved here a couple of years ago with his wife. And it's awesome to have him in town. He's an amazing resource. Uh, I've been going on some walks with David and picking his brain and uh, just always makes sense when we talk. Um, so thank you, David, for, for being here. My pleasure. Yeah. And I would mention, too, that David's also uh, an author. He's got several books out. Uh, that's how I first heard of him, uh, through his uh, written work. And I'm just going to Google real quick a couple <laughs> titles, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> A number of them are on display out by the uh, coffee area. This is a good one. The, the world is, is made of stories. This is the most recent book. And uh, it's, a lot of it is about narrative and how our world is made up of different narratives and stories and how those stories interact and intermingle. Um, I won't go through the whole list. <laughs> and then uh, to David's right is Rohan Gunatilika. Uh, he gave a talk yesterday on practice play and products and the layer, the heart layer. So it's great to have him back. Uh, and then finally, we've got Julie Melton, who is an innovation producer. Is that the term? Consultant? Consultant. Okay, innovation consultant at IDEO. And IDEO is one of the biggest um, innovation consultancies in the world. They work with huge corporations to help them design new products. And so she's been uh, doing that for many years, traveling around the world, helping places like Huggies create better diapers. And... Uh, <laughs> Doing some really important work, actually. So it's great to have her here. Uh, both Rohan and Julie both have this t innovation in their work titles. So obviously, they're bringing that um, to the conversation. And then we've, we kind of got more like Buddhist in our titles, I guess, Buddhist geek and philosopher. So innovators and Buddhists, we'll see how this goes. So um, I just want to open it up, um, maybe for Rohan to start. And if you could say a little bit about your experience being both a Buddhist practitioner and also an innovation producer, um, maybe you could kick us off sure, with I think some we've, distinctions. Yeah, sure. I think we've covered a lot of, a um, number of speakers to date have talked about this thing of conservers versus adapters. Mm. Um, and I, I sort of mentioned at the beginning of my talk how I feel that um, if Ken just defined innovation as taking something that works and applying it to a new context, then we're all innovators in that we take the Dharma teachings and apply them to our personal context and create value through our practice. And so we're all um, personally uh, practicing and innovating. Um, the, uh, and, but, so, but there are conservers and adapters. And the way I, a, a sort of a structure I like to use is the idea that um, if, if 
we're all innovating, but some of us are innovating in such a way that um, preserves the status quo, and some of us are innovating in such a way that are pointing to a whole new way, a whole new sort of paradigm or way of uh, doing things. Mm. Um, and so that's that's always been a useful model, whether it's in my non buddhist professional work. Um, I work a lot with arts organizations in the UK, um, such as the Edinburgh Festivals and other big arts organizations, on how they um, deal with this change. It's the same question that arts organizations face, and which is something I wanted to just bring out now, actually, which is uh, uh, we've talked a lot about us as individual practitioners, and um, the sort of, the, I, my personal takeaway is that, is that the summary of like, in the midst of all this change and digital um, acceleration and so on, we just get by, we, we, we take on what we can, we struggle, we deal with the rate of change in our own personal way, but we, we make it work in a way that's right for us. Um, but I think uh, something we've not spoken about yet is around uh, our institutions and organizations that sit around meditation and Buddhism in the West and elsewhere. Um, I see uh, them facing the same problems that um, uh, an opera house faces or an arts organization faces in that you've got retreat centers who um, their mission is obviously to spread the Dharma and provide teachings to a wide accessible range of people. But actually, if you look at them as a business model, all they're doing is maintaining a building. They're raising funds to keep the lights on and keep the place in toilet tissue when, um, and that's really expensive. So, and it really costs, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you were to really look at the mission of that organization, that could be in developing new programs for 18 to 25 year olds, or whatever it is, uh, whatever's appropriate for that location and tradition. Um, I think that, and I think that's a, 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 an innovation, a real innovation problem that is facing, because yeah, the, the difference between the institutional problems, um, so that's that was something I wanted to, mm -hmm. to add. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, so a, a distinction then between Organizations that have buildings to maintain, or just organizations in general. So as soon mm -hmm. as it, as soon as we have an organization, but it could be a sitting group, which is very free form and just lives, lives in someone's house, or it can be mm -hmm. IMS or one of the big houses in whatever tradition it is. Yeah, um, they have they have a different set of problems um, that we have as individuals, and because their their ability to react and change is so much slower. Um, because of the bureaucracy and the investment and the, the bricks and mortar. So that's a really interesting challenge. Okay. I've, I've known some young practitioners who couldn't afford to do retreats because they were so expensive because the centers that were offering the retreats had these very large mortgages that they had to pay off because they bought these large places that they had remodeled. And so that model is actually driving away a lot of the young people. Yeah, so I'm interested in this question of like, how do we innovate new organizations to support practice, as well as just how do we hack together our own personal way of getting through this stuff. Mm. Okay, so a, a little challenge right out of the gate. Good. And then Julie, um, you spend a lot of time thinking about innovation. Like yeah. What is innovation? Ken McLeod mentioned, you know, innovation isn't just doing something new, it's actually doing something new in a new context. Um, you also did a poll with the IDEO folks who are all I, dealing with this. And I did, yeah. I mean, we, we think about innovation every day. Yeah. Even. And um, I, it was remarkable, the, the lack of agreement about this term. Like, it, it's just, it's sort of the word of the moment, right? I mean, everyone's talking about innovation and, and no one, it's sort of like, you know it when you see it, but like, no one quite aligns on what it means. I, I think for me, the definition that works the most and is the most useful is the process of creating newness with a purpose, right? Like, you can have an invention that's totally wacky, that's not useful for anything, but you can't really have an innovation that's not useful for anything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's within the term, it's inherently meaning that there is some use for this, or that it makes things better in some way, and that it's new to the world. So, so as we talked about, like IDEO is an innovation firm. Um, we help our clients do new things. We work with organizations that wanna do something new, whether that's a new product, a new service, um, whatever it is that is sort of uh, outside of the realm of what they're currently doing, we help them take that next step to get there. Mm. And so we have a, a process for doing this, a process for helping them go along this path. And um, this is called human-centered design. Mm. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the, the, the core practices and, and beliefs of human-centered design um, that might sound a little familiar to you. 
um, paying attention, being present, accepting what is, being open to change, right? Like not, none of this should sound like totally wacky to anyone in here, right? Like this is what we do as Buddhists, right? Like this is our practice. And, and for me, there is this really remarkable connection between the work that I do on a daily basis and my practice, right? And so I think just telling a little bit about, um, you know, as we, as we talk about innovation, kind of step through an example of an innovation process at IDEO and just to give you a sense of, of what I mean when I talk about an innovation process. So just kind of make it a little bit more concrete. Great. Um, so human-centered design starts with human, right? Um, my, my official title at IDEO is des a design researcher. So my job is to understand people's real perspectives, the real needs, behaviors. Um, we have this idea at IDEO that people want to solve problems that are real to them, like what's actually going on with them. And so we want to understand what's actually going on with people. So the, what often happens, as, and you know, again, like this process morphs, it changes, we innovate, this, we innovate our innovation process continuously, <laughs> right? But one way that this can typically go is that we start with this insight phase, right? Where we want to just understand like, what are some big ideas that we didn't know before, right? Like, what are some ways that we can um, get inspired by the world to move forward? And we often do this through having very targeted, focused conversations with people. And I'll just, um, we talked about a couple examples. I think one example that I'd love to talk about is some, some work I've done recently around flight training. So working with an organization that wants to help people um, learn how to fly planes and how to get over some um, fears and, and concerns that they have about flying. So we talk to people who are current flight students. We talk to people who are pilots. Um, we also talk to people who are what we term like working in analogous spaces. So people who do something or think about something that is not exactly what we're looking at, but is far enough out that we can see interesting things kind of kind of poking out in ways that we wouldn't if we were just focused on the one idea. Like so, ice road truckers or something? I, yeah, 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 right? I mean, I could see how that would be interesting as an analogous space if we're thinking about fear, right, and process and protocol and talking to like a novice ice road trucker about like, how do you know, how do you, when do you feel safe? When do you not feel safe? How do you know um, that when you get on the radio with someone, they'll be able to hear you and you'll be able to communicate well, right? So those are all things that pilots have to think about. So that would be a great way of thinking about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we have these conversations, it's really, really focused, right? Like I um, travel around the world and I talk to people usually in their homes, you know, and you're sitting with someone um, for an hour and a half, two hours, and having this like very, very focused experience with them which is such a neat thing, right? Like it's not so often in our lives that we get to talk mm. to someone who we've never met before, we'll probably never meet again, and we're sitting here talking to them about like their deepest fears, their deepest needs. Um, and to really be in that conversation and to really do that well, you have to let all of your own stuff go, right? Mm. Like you have to like kind of let go of your own biases and your own prejudices and your own expectations for like what someone should be thinking or what they should be doing. And just you have to be there with them and accept not only reality as it is, as objectively as you can, but also really try to understand like what this person's reality is to them. Like what is their life really like? And, and to me that has enormous alignment with my practice, right? Of just trying to really be there with the world as it is and to move outside of your own head and your own sort of preconceived ideas. So the next step in this, and I'm sort of abbreviating this because I could talk for two weeks about this, but just to shrink it down, we go out, we learn some things, um, and then our, our work then is to be a sort of like empathy funnel or conduit to like bring all of this, <laughs> uh, all this stuff that we've felt and that we've learned into a process of making things, <clears throat> developing things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So at this point, we do prototyping, right? It's really easy and delightful to come back from the field and think like, oh, I've solved it. This is the way. This is the one thing. And then to build that out and make it really beautiful and really shiny, and it's like this, this perfect solution. But that really limits innovation, right? If you, if you move to like one solution very fast. So we cultivate non-attachment through prototyping. 
So let's say we come back, and now we are thinking about insulin injection devices, right? We might come back and make 500 sketches of injection devices. And then from there, we might make 100 prototypes out of paper. And from there, we might make 50 out of plastic. And, and we do this so that you can, yeah, like you don't, you don't get too attached. That you can really think a little bit more openly and broadly and fluidly about the space that you're working in. And then you keep going through this process, right, of, of, of testing these, of understanding the market, right, of understanding the business environment, of understanding manufacturing, what people will use, and what, right. So from there, you have like the, the one at the end, right? Like this is, this is the best one. And this is the one that we're going to manufacture and we're going to put on the market. But then there are 499 that someone loved at some point that are left on the floor, right? So again, that's the sort of like remarkable opportunity to think about loss and think about impermanence mm -hmm. and how these things that at one point were what we were so focused on and believing in are gone, and that's okay, right? And so we, we um, move through this process. Like this is what we do, right? Like this is my daily life. Um, and, you know, I think my challenge for all of you is to think about your daily lives and to think about what you're cultivating on a day-to-day -day basis and ways that you can um, align your work with your practice in a way that feels meaningful to you. And, and also think about connecting with other people in a way that feels meaningful and, and to not just think of, you know, your work as this thing that's like totally separate and like devoid of meaning or devoid of connection in, in the greater context of your life. Okay. So prototype early and prototype often. That's yes. one of the phrases you've used for, yeah. for this process. Yeah. And then 499 of those prototypes are sitting on the floor at the end of the process. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And David, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about, um, I guess more on the, the sort of Buddhist side of what, what is Buddhism trying to do anyway? Mm. And how could we improve on that if that's even possible? <laughs> <laughs> How long would you like me to talk for you? <laughs> as long as you want. Uh, well, as, as many of us have been alluding to, um, talking about innovation in the Buddhist context brings us pretty immediately back to the original teachings of the Buddha, who emphasized impermanence and insubstantiality. So, you know, the world isn't a collection of separate things that occasionally affect each other. It's really a a confluence of processes. Everything's a process. And every process is dependent on lots of other processes. Uh, and what's really important about it in this context, of course, is uh, that applies to Buddhism itself. Uh, for a lot of religious traditions, they have some sort of eternal verities that you're supposed to grab and hold on to. But if Buddhism isn't transforming, it's not being true to itself. And I think we see that pretty clearly. Uh, when Buddhism went to China, for example, it didn't just sort of export its teachings. It engaged in a kind of mutual interaction, mutual causality with the local tradition. And for example, the tradition that I uh, trained in Zen, with Chan originally, um, was an outgrowth. And, and I think what, what probably brings most of us, or all of us here today, to this conference, of course, is that we're in this very exciting moment when this ancient tradition is challenged by its greatest other culture ever, right? I mean, Western modernity, not, maybe we can't call it Western because it's global now, right? Modernity. And this fascinating conversation going on, not just that Buddhism comes to the West, but the West comes to Buddhism, and what does each have to learn from the other? But I think sooner or later, we, we can't avoid this whole baby and bathwater question, you know? It's like, we know we can change a lot of things, we have to change a lot of things, but how do we know that we're not sort of losing the essence or the heart of the Dharma in the process? And I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to sort of try to articulate that, try to distinguish what, what's really the heart of what the Buddha's message is about. And different people will do it different ways, but for me, uh, there's a wonderful summary by the great Indian teacher, uh, Nisargadatta. Actually, he's not a Buddhist, he's a Vedantin, but I think he puts it better than anybody else I know. He said, quote, when I look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love. Between these two, my life turns. 
And these, I mean, he's really getting at it, the two wings of the Dharma, wisdom, realizing our true nature, and compassion, living in a way that's compatible with that. What I think is so important about that is when we talk about the kind of transformation that Buddhism is pointing toward, it's not just about sort of self-help or feeling better about ourselves, but it really goes very, very deep, realizing the sense in which there is no separate self. For me, the essential teaching has to do with this sense of separation, that we have this fundamental delusion that I'm in here, the world is out there. This is what the self is. The self, if there's a self, there's a not-self. There's something outside. And what the Buddha, I think, is really pointing out is the deep suffering connected with that and the importance of a tradition and a practice that helps us over, overcome that. Mm -hmm. Another way to describe it is the path is really about the deconstruction and the reconstruction of the sense of self. So that instead of operating out of this delusion of separation, we're realizing, for example, that each of us is simply one of the ways in which all of this comes together right here and now. Uh, especially important in this context because we live in such a self-preoccupied, really narcissistic culture that encourages us to always ask this question, what's in it for me? Um, so, so we still have this question, and how, how do we know that this is what our innovations are still helping to do? It's like, Within the teachings, the institutions, and so forth, everything can be let go, everything can be changed as long as this fundamental process is still what's ongoing. But it's still tricky to determine you know, what it is that's helping to do that. And this is, I think, the second point that the Buddha has to offer us, which is a really important part of his revolutionary tr transformation, the emphasis on intentionality. You know, we always need to ask, What's motivating what we're doing? What's motivating our innovations? Uh, what the Buddha really picked out is that if we're motivated by greed, ill will, illusion, then we're going to be creating problems for ourselves and for other people. And here's the complication, I think, that today we have a new situation that the Buddha himself didn't face, but I think these three poisons or three fires are, have been institutionalized. Um, if greed is you never have enough, well, I think that's our economic system in which you know, people never consume enough, corporations are never profitable enough, the GNP is never big enough, and if the economy doesn't keep growing, it collapses. We've institutionalized aggression as our militarism. And institution is, delu is uh, sorry, delusion is institutionalized as our media, which isn't concerned to educate or inform us, but rather is preoccupied with making sure we understand ourselves as consumers, right? So this is what we really need to ask today, whether the kind of innovations that we're bringing to Buddhism, are they, how are they relating to this institutionalized greed, ill will, and delusion? Are they challenging it? Are they helping us work toward a society in which we're transforming these problematic institutions? Or are they perhaps, is Buddhism now perhaps helping us fit in rather too comfortably into these institutions? What I'm getting at, and I'm sorry, I know I'm talking too soon, but finish with this. <laughs> Just a final word that this, this really important European philosopher, uh, Slavoj Žižek, mm. said something really important. He says, in his opinion, Buddhism is the perfect ideology for 21st century consumer capitalism. Wow, we better think about that. I mean, is Buddhism helping us become better consumers? Is Buddhism uh, helping us in our overstressed lives sort of find some serenity, some peace of mind so we can work better, make more money and consume better? Or is Buddhism really challenging this fundamental institutional system? I think this is the basic problem that when we ask about innovation, this, this really needs to be in the back of our minds. Are we innovating in ways that fit nicely into this system, make it work better, or are we innovating in ways that are really challenging it? Sorry I talked too long. <laughs> no, no. So I'd, I'd love to respond to that because I, I feel like, um, you know, as we're using uh, 
Yes, I mean, we want to challenge the system, right? I think that's, we can agree. We would like to challenge the system. And I think for me, one thing that's been, that's been interesting working with, with really giant organizations is realizing there's no such thing as a giant organization. It's a lot of individual people, right? Mm -hmm. So I think as we think about our lives and our work and how we relate to people as individuals, how we can help people as individuals think about fear and attachment and suffering and empathy and, and bring this into the people who, who are you know, working for these organizations and working together, how can we help them make decisions that are wise and are kind, right? So I, I think it's just something for us to, to, to keep in mind is that there's no, you know, like the separation between us and, and organizations is maybe not so real. But I guess I would want to add to that, that uh, although that's true, it's also the nature of a lot of modern institutions, especially corporations, that they're structured, they're chartered in a way that their primary responsibility is to the shareholders and to provide profitability to them. And I mean, profit is not inherently bad, but nonetheless, often the way that it works with the mega corporations is that that's at the price of a lot of other things. So that's one of the things we have to look at is the, the role, the way in which some of these corporations are, are structured. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's also, it's up to us to show from, you know, a market perspective why it makes sense to be kind to people, right? Like, I'm just going to put this out there. Like, you know, if we, if we think about solving real problems for people and how there's a market for that, how can we help people who are making these decisions make decisions that are in line with, with being, you know, wise and, and, and far thinking? So one thing that you hear a lot is this like, like triple bottom line as companies start thinking about, like let's not only think about profit, but you know, people, planet, and profit. And, and you hear the term triple bottom line used a lot. Within organizations, it's something that more and more companies are really thinking about as, as our world is shifting. So I, I don't think that it's entirely like um, people aren't thinking about these things and they're not open. Like I, I think the process is starting and I think that we can help move that forward. Yeah, I think it's good. To, it's good to mention um, in, in in terms of systems that there are a lot of uh, movements happening right now in the in the business world um, mm -hmm. around kind of hybrid hybrid for profit organizations, like like Julie mentioned, things that are looking at multiple bottom lines and are trying to hold multiple aims and motivations and intentions, and um, that seems like a really also a challenging thing to do. I mean, we're trying to do it with some of our work, and there's always this question of well. What are we, yeah, what, what are our decisions based on? What's our strategy based on? Um, and it's holding, holding the necessity of both being prosperous and profitable, like Tammy mentioned the other day, and also doing good in the world and making sure that our impact um, is, is, you know, to use a Buddhist term, it's a, it's a, it's a wholesome impact. Like we, we're actually doing good through what we create and also that our, that our impact is, is not um, uh, causing people to, you know, lose something important. Um, so anyway, I, just 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 to say, I think I think you're right. Systems are real, and that um, you know we're the ones that engineer those systems. Vince, can I ask a lot of the time? Can I ask a question? Just because I'm, I'm not sure how to word it, but I just want to respond. Something came to mind when David was talking. About, so yeah. talking about how uh, going back to so this idea of the cultural, the three fires, as Michael called them, as the cultural. Um, uh, fires uh, and you call them uh, sort of uh, institutional, so around greed, hatred, and delusion, as in in bigger in bigger scale mm -hmm. than just the individual you yeah. know, experience. And then you said talked about how the Buddhist teaching was very much the Buddha's original teaching was very much based on the internal experience, um, and that he wasn't he wasn't uh, working in that context of institutional fires. And so my question is, if when if we're innovating practices in general that are looking to address and douse those fires, can we infer, I don't, I, I, I'm agnostic as to the, result, the answer to this question, can we infer that the, the original Buddhist teachings on internal fires are automatically scalable to institutional fires? Mm -hmm. I don't know, the, but I think that's if it feels like a really, if we're, if we're innovating practices, maybe they are radically different types of practices to the scaling sort of individual in, uh, contemplative practice to uh, culture-wide practice? No, I, I think that's a really important question. Um, 
at the time of the Buddha, um, the Buddha and the Sangha that he founded, they had to be very careful. I mean, mm. uh, none of the Asian societies was democratic. In order for Buddhism to survive and thrive, it had to be very careful in its relationship with the state. And sometimes problems arose because of the way that karma could be used to rationalize actually the power of the king or the emperor, just in the way that the divine right of kings was used in Europe mm. to sort of rationalize the, uh, the power of, of, of the royalty. Um, so there's a sense in which if, if we look at the essential teaching of the Buddha as understanding and overcoming dukkha, I think there were some constraints at that time that don't apply now in a more democratic world, well, to some extent more democratic, but also a world with more communication technologies where we're also being able to appreciate what the Abrahamic traditions are having to say about social justice. Mm. So in a way, I, I guess I'm saying that even if original Buddhism in Asia was limited in that regard, I don't think we have to understand ourselves as limited in the same way today. If we really focus on dukkha in the large sense and ask the question, you know, what's the causes of dukkha? We can see that, I mean, often Buddhism is interpreted in terms of individual karma, your suffering is due to what you did in past lifetimes. I think that's a bit naive if that's the only way we look at it. I think we have so much more understanding now of the way in which we have institutionalized dukkha, mm. uh, and that, therefore, we have to ask the question, uh, how do we understand and how do we address institutionalized dukkha as well? But to answer it also in a, in a slightly different vein, if Buddhism is about overcoming the sense of separation, realizing that I'm not separate from the rest of the world, that there's a sense in which the suffering of other people then becomes my suffering, and, and, the, and the challenge is how can I... How can I respond to that. And of course, we have in the Buddhist tradition this concept of the Bodhisattva path, uh, which today, given our unique situation, I think needs to be understood in a more socially engaged that way that also you know, challenges economic and political institutions. Mm. So, thank you. It's really good. Um, this is a big question. I mean, these are big questions. Yeah, they are. They're really yeah. big questions. Yeah. Um, I love that we're getting into trying to parse out and distinguish between individual and collective or systemic but suffering. Also, so the relationship. And, and the how relationship, do they relate? Right. And how exactly. are we separate yeah. from systemic suffering or not? Mm -hmm. um, and that was so striking about questions. Michael's talk this morning of how yeah. he took his, his, his learnings from his own deep experience and, and saw the, the, the experience of Occupy as through that lens, that was such a powerful way of translating into those different domains. I was very yeah. moved by that. Nice. So we, we also wanted to open it up uh, kind of in, in a dialogue and in a conversation with you guys, um, because I know a lot of you work in institutions. Um, a lot of you started institutions. A lot of you think about innovation. You're pioneers in terms of Dharma practices and systems. So um, if, if there are any comments or questions that we could include into this conversation would be awesome. Um, there's a mic there, and we're happy to open it up and continue exploring this um, with you guys. All right, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was doing some research this year on burnout. And Burma? I, burnout? Burnout, oh God. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm almost there, researching. <laughs> And um, one of the things that I found interesting was that uh, in research around burnout, one of the highest, uh, and this was mostly in the nursing profession, but I think it kind of applies across the board, is that uh, one of the major reasons for burnout was called moral outrage, hmm. which is when your values don't match the values of your institution hmm. or the institution where you work. So on the one hand, my question is, you could say, uh, as you just did, that, that um, there are no organizations, they're just made up of individuals. But on the other hand, we also know that individuals are also made up of organizations. Our, we, we've internalized our value system based on the organizations that we swim in. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, moral outrage and, and, and um, how you see it in institutions and how we can open up to it maybe without trying to just like keep it in the corner, you know. Mm. 
Mm. And, and anybody can respond to this, especially the innovators. <laughs> I think engaging with, I, I think it's our responsibility to engage with organizations. I think it's really easy to say, um, you know, big corporations are evil, I don't want anything to do with them, but I don't, I don't know if that's, what that's going to change. You know, I think it's up to us to really engage in a deep way with what people are really doing and what they're feeling and the decisions they're making in, in order to really change these bigger systems and processes. And, and I think if you... I don't know. I mean, I think we're, if you're feeling moral burnout, think about what's within what you can change, right? I mean, like, where the limits of your agency are and from within where you are, what can you do? And, and maybe it's not changed the entire thing, but maybe from where you are in your place, like, what can you affect and do? And I'd, I'd love for people to really feel like they, they do have agency, and I think that a lot of us, like, really have much more agency than, than we realize. I've, I've sort of, in the sort of opposite to that, um, I've been in a situation where I've been in organizations where I, so um, not, not as extreme maybe as the nursing profession, but where I had very strong opposition or views to the senior leadership of that organization. Um, and I was often seen as the, the sort of the socially motivated guy in the organization. And so it was, uh, I was well supported, I was appreciated and valued um, in that organization. Um, I had about, in each case, there are two particular cases in my career where I just decided to leave mm. because you, as, that, as that practitioner, as, a, as that innovator, you have all that person, I'd call it an innovator because I was trying to, I was trying to make change in that organization. Um, you, I had to make the choice, do I care enough about this organization to put myself through the pain mm -hmm. of this isolated state and bashing my head against that wall? Or do I just nurture myself and put myself into an environment of wise friends? Um, so, and I think that is the, that's the, like, that's the question that I've asked at key points in my life. And that's always been the right, it's totally been the right time. And that it's, I've not been strong enough to be in that, despite being valued in those organizations to, um, to be, and it, and it wasn't the case that I was the sort of, um, it wasn't, it wasn't token or anything like that, but, um, that you have to really look after, you have to look after, it's, a, it's, the, it's the question of, um, uh, we've all been in meditation retreats where this, the same question comes up of like this thing about being open to everything and if I'm open to everything then I'll be a doormat and people will tread over me. And it's the same, it's the same thing in an organizational context and um, I think you just have to be really honest about how much do I really care about this organization um, and am I willing to put myself through the personal sacrifice of that? Um, in, in the service of the wider mission. Mm -hmm. um, if I could also just say a quick word, um, especially about the idea of burnout, uh, because I think this is an area that Buddhism has something really, really important to contribute, which is the bodhisattva path. I mean, the bodhisattva is defined as someone who uh, vows to become awakened for the benefit of all living beings. And what's unique about it, I think, is that, therefore, there, there's two sides to the practice. On the one hand, the bodhisattva today can well be a social activist out there with Occupy Wall Street or working uh, on the pipeline issues, whatever. But nonetheless, there's at the same time as the activism, there's also the inner practice, the meditation, the working on oneself, the getting in touch with the emptiness, getting in touch with the, the core Buddha nature, helping to avoid that... And so I think the two things work very well together. And this may be, in fact, one of the most important things that Buddhism has to contribute. The emphasis on bringing together our work for personal individual transformation with our work towards social transformation and the need to see these as two sides of the same coin. Mm. Great. Please. And this is probably the, the obvious question in terms of innovation. Uh, we live in a very male-dominated uh, society, and so we think in terms of problem, how do we fix that problem? You know, Steve Jobs, one of the greatest innovators, fixed a problem we didn't know we had. And then how do you reconcile that with the idea of are things fixable, things are impermanent? What is innovation within that context? Mm, okay, good question. 
Well, I mean, when I heard Julie speaking about the human-centered design, I, I felt like that in some ways was bridging this whole issue of male dominated and female and that, you know, you're sitting and really listening to people and becoming, you said a conduit of empathy. Yeah. And to me, that's, you know, very much melding the, the desire to care and to listen and to respond with the desire to fix a problem. So from, in my mind, there's not really a, a conflict so much with that because they're coming out of the same desire to, to alleviate suffering. Yeah, and I, and I think solving problems that people didn't know they had is, is what we do as, as innovators. I mean, if we just kind of took a poll from people and said, okay, what do you want? You know, and then we did that, like that wouldn't really be very innovative, right? So, but, but really paying attention to what people really need, what they really want, combined with, you know, being inventive and being creative and looking for insight, I think that's where we can create really new things. So I have a very complex observation that I'm going to try and make as simple as possible. <laughs> um, and that's that I feel like there's a kind of innovation that has been happening and could inform the growth of Buddhist culture really well that's not easy to find in Buddhist discussions. And that's the work that's been done by anarchist collectives, feminist collectives in South America with farmers collectives non-hierarchical education like Paulo Freire or Theater of the Oppressed. There's an enormous number of experiments that have been done in the last 40 years about how to structure social interaction and community that dismantle hierarchy, uh, dig into our implicit assumptions about each other. And there's an incredible amount of knowledge of what really works. The problem is it's all sort of become embedded in identity politics. Mm. And identity politics is right at where the ego is. And so the conversation is so uncomfortable mm. that we just get as far as I want to be good, and then we sort of <laughs> go, OK, let's go do that at home. Now, I work with prisoners and drug addicts in Vancouver. And one of the things that I run into is that after the meditation teachers and the yoga teachers have gone to prisons and rehabs, no center wants to bring in a rapist to their community. No center wants to bring in a child molester to their retreat, which, and it's not, I'm, I mean, I'm saying no. I'm sure there are many individuals and many structures that would like that. But I think a place where innovation could happen very naturally is if we began to bridge the abyss between those who have and those who are marginalized and who have such low status that they only cause us to feel suffering, if we bridge that and are forced to really say, how can I humanly face all of my assumptions and all of my fears and all of my dharmic wisdom and have you come into my retreat and make it be safe for both of us? Just a real honest discussion internally. There's huge innovation that could happen there and tools that have been being developed by activists for decades. And I feel like I've been waiting for this conversation to happen and go to conferences. Anyhow, I'd love to hear if any of you have an opinion about that. Mm. Can I, can I respond? Please. Thank you. I think, that's, I think that's really, really important. And I think that is a conversation that is just getting started. I mean, I think this is the real innovation. You know, Within Asia, the Buddhist tradition, for better and worse, focused on inner technologies, developing this wonderful, the world's greatest collection of contemplative practices to transform ourselves. Given the social context, maybe that's what it had to focus on. But now, that Buddhism comes to modernity and can also benefit from what the Abrahamic traditions and also modernity has learned about these other kinds of alternatives, these other techniques. I think this is the most exciting conversation of all, how these two are, are really coming together in our time. Can I say something good? So um, I was at a, reminds me very much what you said, Kira, about, um, I was at a dinner in London a couple of weeks ago and the guy sitting next to me is a guy called Serja Popovic, Serbian chap. And it was sort of one of those dinners where no one knew anyone, says, so oh, the whole, what do you do? And Serja said, I teach people how to have revolutions. Um, and that's like the best start to any conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So Serja was, a, um, during the uh, Milosevic regime in Serbia, he was a student protester and organized as a group and went all the way through to being a member of parliament in Serbia. And what they, what they saw was that there were lots, there was lots of, um, they, they'd learned a lot about how, how it worked and how what doesn't work. Um, and there were lots of examples around the world of other revolutionary successes and failures of which there was um, some learning. But what was missing for him was, and there was an academic literature of it as well, like, but it was the missing gap. So he basically said, what we did as our organization, we wrote Revolution for Dummies. Uh, it's not called that, it's called Nonviolent, blah, blah, blah. But, um, uh, <laughs> um, um, and he goes around the world training people to have revolutions. How you do it, codify it. And I think this is the, I think this is the missing piece, which is there are brilliant examples, be it things you've described, like massive, like incredible social programs like Sistema in Venezuela, which teach social change through music, all these things, but it's, uh, I, having worked in the, let's call it innovation industry and social innovation industry in the UK, um, what's really, what, what we as a social innovation community are struggling to do in Europe is scale a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, it's, how, because the, the, tri the trick is, and it's, this is really difficult, is how do you codify something that works really well in Bogota or in Caracas and make it work in Glasgow or Boulder or Vancouver? Um, and uh, I think we need more people like Serge's group who can go around and who, who codify it from a practitioner perspective, not an academic perspective. Um, and so that, there's something in that in that, I would, that, that I felt relevant. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. All right, Duff. All right, so one thing I'm very, very interested in is the innovation of various techniques for personal change, for meditation, these sorts of things. We have some innovative pioneers here in the audience and up on stage. Uh, Ken Folk has innovated some interesting techniques. Um, I guess I'm wondering about those sort of the, the downsides to innovation, potentially. So um, in Buddhism in particular, there's a tension between what used to be and what is new and innovative. Um, and that tension is not necessarily even new itself. Uh, David Chapman, here, back over here, he's not up on stage, has written some interesting things about how modern Buddhist practice is essentially not that old. It's been innovated itself. Mm -hmm. um, but people tend to hold on to that as, uh, you know, that's the ancient way, which may be only a couple hundred years old, actually, and really innovated from rereadings of the text. Um, so I guess I'm curious, as we innovate new techniques, uh, what will keep us connected to the, the essential, if there is any essential uh, identity of what Buddhism is all about? And what are some potential ways we could get off track? Uh, maybe uh, the woman from IDEO could speak to this in terms of uh, how do we innovate in a way that is actually going to bring something useful and purposeful and not... Um, just invent something radically weird and different or that has negative side effects in the future and that sort of thing? Mm. I think it's through really paying attention, you know, and, and through what, what David was saying, you know, like keeping, keeping the core. Um, I, I don't think it's really inno innovation, you know, just however we're defining this term. I don't think it's really innovation if it means that you're just doing something totally different that's not serving any needs or any purposes, right? Like, that's just change. Right, change isn't, isn't necessarily good. I think innovation implies a certain moving towards a, a place that's more wise um, in a way that is systematic, it's a process, it's a process that you're fully engaged with and aware of and embedded in. And I think if you um, just take this slowly, right? And like if you're, if you're making a, a change that doesn't feel right, pay attention to that, right? Like what doesn't feel right about this? So like how does this feel like we're losing the core, that we're stepping away from something essential? And then bringing it back. And, and I think just not being afraid of taking some steps, right? I mean, this is prototyping, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, like tech, take steps and then, and then feel. Like, it, is this making things better or is this not making things better? And if it's not making things better, just, you know, don't become attached to that. Just take a step back. And I think if you, if you do that and you really stay present with that, then you, you won't end up in a place where you don't know where you are. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> That's a good answer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to mention one other piece. It's something that I, I 
feel like I learned while hanging out with um, Ken McLeod last year. And that is that it seems like there are two things that really get in the way of being able to respond to what's actually in front of me mm -hmm. um, and, and actually create something new that, that has a purpose. And one of them, uh, which he pointed out a, a time and again, was uh, the tendency toward idealizing, uh, toward having an ideal about how things should look and then trying to get reality to conform to that ideal. So, ah, we should be able to have, you know, a non-hierarchical exchange of ideas where things aren't being judged, or we should be able to, you know, get along without getting irritated with each other, or, you know, I have an, an endless number of ideals that I bring to the table. And uh, a lot of what seems like innovation is about is stripping those away and starting to see, oh, this is actually how it is right now. Yes. Um, and then the other side, which... Um, is sort of to me the, the the flip of idealism is the is the tendency towards cynicism, towards thinking um, actually everything is kind of fucked and we're fucked and there's really no getting out of this situation. We're just going to kind of go down with the Titanic, um, and there's nothing we really can do because these systems that we're embedded in are so powerful, they're so pervasive, the institutions are so there's so much momentum behind them. What can I do as an individual? I can't do anything. Um, so I, I've been really seeing in myself that my own tendencies toward uh, cynicism and idealism as being some of the, the biggest hindrances toward being able to relate fully to what's happening and to be able to, to respond in a new way. Um, and I feel like that's, that's an interesting way to look at at least the interior part of innovation, uh, like as a designer um, who's trying to create something new. I, I think this is another important aspect about the Bodhisattva path, that you know, so often we can feel really overwhelmed and despair about the state of society and the state of the ecosystem. Uh, but you know, the Bodhisattva takes the vow to save all sentient beings. It's like, this is pretty big. Somebody who's taken that kind of vow isn't going to be intimidated by... Uh, the kinds of ecological and economical challenges that we have today. It's like, it, it's, for a bodhisattva, it, it's more transforming the meaning of one's life away from the old narcissistic, what can I get out of this situation? And basically learning to deal with any situation, you know, uh, first of all, becoming one with it, accepting it, but also asking, okay, what can I contribute to this situation to make it better? Mm. I'm reminded of Suzuki Roshi who told his students, you know, you're all perfect just as you are, but you can also use a little improvement. <laughs> <laughs> that's our world, and that, that's the, the field of the bodhisattva. Mm. Nice. So we can do uh, one more question, I think. Richard. Hi, Vince. Uh, well, you ruined my everything is fucked opener, so now I have to think <laughs> something. Uh, Sorry. Um, no, listening to you guys, I was thinking about my own experience, and I appreciated what you know Rohan said about knowing when he was in a difficult situation, but I was reflecting on the fact that I was in a situation that wasn't right for me for years, but I did the, I made my, I tried to make my ideals reflect my reality. So if you, you know, I work for, you know, people who know me or listen to me or, you know, think I'm unsympathetic to the corporate life or technology sometimes. I was AIG's an ovation guy for years and flew all over the world for them and tried to, you know, develop a, a meditation practice, but I was like a cat trying to climb a wall of ice. You know, I couldn't get a grip and I didn't know why until in reflection I realized that I had had to jump off a kind of cliff in my own perception that just says, you know, the, I'll date myself with the old talking head song, you know, this is not your beautiful house, this is not your beautiful job, this is not, you know, your beautiful family, that I had to really say, no, I had constructed a reality and now was trying to retrofit my ideals to that and that wasn't compatible with what I was experiencing in meditation. And I guess where I'm going with all of this is when we talk about innovation, at least when we used to talk about it, a lot of times it was that simple note, you, you're not in the business you think you're in. You know, Huggies or whatever, you, you make something up. You're not in the diaper business, you're in the time shifting when parents have to clean their baby, you, you know, whatever it is. So in a sense, we may not be in the business of, quote unquote, of uh, personal well-being, you know, um, comfort, uh, serenity, 
But if we're not, if we're in that business of confronting the truth, how do we as a community and those of you who are teachers confront the radical um, effects that that may have and help people through them? Because if it, someone had said it to me, hey, Richard, we're delighted that you're meditating. You're going to lose the house. You're going to lose the job. You're going to lose the wife and have to, you'll, you'll remarry somebody more. So if somebody had, I would have said, the hell with this and run away. And I'm a hundred times happier now. But how do we help people through that, <laughs> off that cliff? <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's funny, but it's also uh, an intense question. Yeah, we can push it, but uh, that's basically what happened to me. But um, I think it's a question we have to face if we really are going in the direction this conversation seems to be going, which I like, and we really are going to innovate, it may mean, you know, managing people through a kind of birth canal process. And, and uh, I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are about that. If I could just say a word, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're touching on one of the main weaknesses, if not the main weakness of American Buddhism, to be frank. Uh, I mean, you remember the three treasures, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. We have lots of Buddhas. We have lots of teachers. We have lots of teachings. But the weakness is Sangha, community. The truth is, especially in our narcissistic society, we're all starved for community. And in a way, what I think we're working toward, even at this conference, right, what brings us together is, is, I mean, and you know, we spend a lot of money and time and effort to get here just for a few days. What's going on? We have this sense, this deep sense, this deep need for community. If we're going to be able to let go and fall off that cliff and engage in those real transformations, we need a lot of help from each other. And that's one of the things that excites me so much about what's going on here with Buddhist geeks. Cool. Okay, that feels like a good note to end on. <laughs>